Greetings in our precious name, Jesus Christ. It is by grace that we can come together like this on a Sunday morning. And let us value that as a gift from God. You see some visitors here, I welcome them as well to be among us. Feel at home, it's my desire. And as we know, there is uh, different viruses going around. And most of us have had probably some of, of that in our home. And that's uh, very fortunate if, if we recover quickly and are healthy again. And quite, quite a few are on, on a trip these days. And that's uh, probably the reason why the building is not filled up as, as it usually is. But uh, that does not keep us from worshiping God. Take time to be holy as we sang already. May each one receive a blessing for coming out today. As normally, December is a busy month, especially when it comes to mid of the month, when we uh, go shopping, go to town, <clears throat> there is uh, lots of traffic like it was yesterday, lots of traffic in the, on the streets. And there is uh, Shopping malls are crowded with, with uh, shoppers. Couriers are busy delivering boxes and boxes. Many, many lights are hung out for people to see. Music changes at many places for those for the month of December. And certain trees are cut and put into houses to be enjoyed. What is it all about? When we see that and we experience it, what do you think? What, what is the reason? <clears throat> Many people are celebrating the beauty of the lights hanging on houses and trees. Many are worshiping Mary this time of the year. Many are celebrating gifts and sweets, enjoyment, flashly enjoyment. Many are singing joyous songs about the birth of Jesus, and the list could go on and on. But how many are celebrating the joy of a personal redeemer? Jesus, who has come into their heart and is the ruler of the heart. It was interesting I, uh, and this morning in, in our devotion, I had noticed that the question here, what's the difference between celebrating Jesus at Christmas and celebrating the season of Christmas? Do you see a difference in, in that? What's the difference between celebrating Jesus at Christmas and celebrating the season of Christmas? <clears throat> Today, I'm thankful that we do not have to, to judge who celebrates the season of Christmas and who celebrates Jesus at Christmas. That's not, not our duty to judge who, is, who is, does that and who does that. But my desire is that we as church, each one of us, would shine out with the real reason of joy through the year, not just uh, not just in December, not just in the season of, of this year, but through the whole year that we would, would shine a light that people can see 
God sees the heart and he knows who is worshiping him and who is worshiping whatever the world offers at this time of the year. He knows exactly. He knows our hearts. My theme verse for today is Matthew 4, verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region of shadow of death, light is sprung up. When we think of darkness, our thoughts might go back to Genesis chapter 1 where light started and darkness had to leave. Let us not confuse the two places we find in Genesis about, about darkness. There's different places on, that uh, talks about darkness. In Genesis 1 verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. It was not dark at that, that point of time. <clears throat> in verse 4, And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. The darkness has to flee when, <clears throat> when light comes. Verse 5, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. <clears throat> and the evening and the morning were the first day. So that's where, <clears throat> where it happened that the, the light came. The darkness had to flee, but then God arranged that, that part of... Uh, a part of time would be darkness and part of time would would be light and that makes makes day and night and we see uh, god's faithfulness that over all the years uh, 6000 plus years how many that is but uh, even though he extended that uh, he he kept that faithful the light and the darkness, day and night, even though he extended a couple of days through the time, we still have daytime and we have nighttime. <laughs> have uh, a day when it is uh, light and we have the nights when it's, when it's dark. To me, it seems like the nights now are not as dark as they used to be. I don't know if you have thought about that too, but uh, but I wonder what the nights would be like if all man-made lights would be out. All yard lights and whatever lights are on in the night, they would be switched off. Wouldn't it be darker than in the nighttime and than it is as it normally is? But the darkness I want to stress today we find in Genesis 3. <laughs> I had not planned to talk much about daytime and, and nighttime, that, that kind of darkness. In Genesis 3, God had put Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden where they had everything they needed, all kinds of food they could think of, fellowship with God, as we read in chapter 3. I didn't find what what I thought I would find uh, when reading it over again. That uh, my impression was that that uh, maybe I haven't uh, looked at the right right verses. But my impression was that Adam and Eve had a daily walk with with God in the garden in the evening when it got cool. But I didn't find it in this part here. But that is a good uh, good thought if that would have been that way. But, but we find that, that that he was coming in the garden when it uh, in the cool of the day and toward toward evening. So that that's a wonderful picture in the Garden of Eden, and God comes and walks with with them together. That's a very beautiful picture of fellowship. But we read in. Uh, Verse 6, so a special tree in the midst of the garden. Very good fruit as Eve saw it. And it was a beauty and told him not to eat from that tree, but he has it, had his purpose. 
they had they didn't need to eat from that tree be, uh, because of uh, of need because they had lots and lots of fruit they could eat beside this tree other trees and eve thought about what the serpent said and started to believe that believe what he said about that tree In verse 4 and the serpent said unto the woman ye shall not surely die and she listened to that god had said they would they would die and now a serpent said you would you will not you will surely not die verse 5 for god doth know that in the day ye eat thereof then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil notice here in this verse that it, uh, it does not say they would be like god it says and ye shall be as gods there's an s behind god and god is does not have start with a capital letter so that's here we see that that is not like god and so we notice something dangerous there is something some danger in that knowing that you shall be as gods knowing good and evil were six and when the woman saw the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with with her and he did eat were seven and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons we see here right away a, a disappointment the serpent said it would be better after she would eat but it was not so the same thing happens today over and over people who give and to satan's offers are disappointed i thought it would be better after it but when i did it after that it, it was so miserable i felt so so bad and i'm sure <clears throat> if uh, adam and eve he would have had a choice to to reverse that they would have done that they would have reversed eating of that fruit and that's uh, <clears throat> that's not possible so they had to to reap and that's the way it is today if, if we do something we are aware right away of, oh this this i should not have done this i am disappointed but we cannot not make that undone we have to to reap what we sow then in verse 8 it says and they heard the voice of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day wonderful scene to adam and eve in the garden and god was walking in the garden in the cool of the day <clears throat> a relaxing time and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of god amongst the tree of the garden that does not sound very much like fellowship and god and the lord god called unto adam adam and said unto him where art thou and he said i heard thy voice in the garden and i was afraid because i was naked and i hid myself the real fellowship with god was ruined adam was afraid of god never before had he been afraid of god god was his friend but the serpent had 
told them it would be better after eating from that tree. But it wasn't. They felt so miserable. Verse 11, and he said, and God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? Have you had fellowship with someone else? And the man said, The woman whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Was that a valid excuse? The woman that you gave me <clears throat> to be with me, she gave me, and I did eat. God does not not uh, say much about that, as it sounds here, like in uh, verse 13, and it says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, so he turns now unto, unto Eve. <clears throat> if that is so, Adam says that, that the woman had given him, and now he turns to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Do we sometimes blame others for what we were responsible for? That seems to be the the easiest way, just to give somebody else, someone else to blame. Verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. So here he comes to the... To the uh, <coughs> object that that really was was the, the guilty thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy valley shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life <clears throat> I sometimes wonder what what uh, <clears throat> the serpent would have been before would have how many legs would it have had when it uh, God says that from now on you shall shall be on your belly. And as we know the snakes today, they <clears throat> they don't have legs. But that's uh, not that not the importance in in this part. Verse fifteen, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So that's a battle we are still fighting today. Satan is the same as he was 6,000 years ago, and, <clears throat> and he works still the same way. And that is trying to convince us to believe lies. That is a tool he, uses, he used first. And that worked, <clears throat> and he is still applying that that tool today to convince us to believe lies, because he is a liar. He is still cursed, as God cursed him that day. So that does not change. John 8, verse 44 says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the loss of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. He's talking about, about Satan. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. We should uh, really take note of, of this, how Satan worked, how he, uh, he tried his first trial on, uh, on, on Eve, and uh, trying to, well, he, had, he was successful to make her believe a lie. 
because never before, as I look at it, never before has there been that many lies out in the public, in the media, and, and wherever, tempting us to believe. Let's hold fast to the truth. When we look at uh, the media, we look at that news today, we, we find it again and again that we might uh, look at it today as as it is the truth, but then then later, maybe a week from from now or a month from now, we realize oh that what was in the news then it was not not the truth. So let's let's be careful what what we believe. <laughs> Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So that's something that that we still have to do. We we are reaping what we sow. Verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam <clears throat> called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of a living, of all living. <clears throat> unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. So we see here, here already that, that God supplies for his people, even though they they had sinned, he he still he still uh, supplies their needs. Verse twenty two, and the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us, as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So out, out of the garden. You, you have to go out. So he uh, drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims <clears throat> and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Darkness. Out of the garden and the gatekeeper that would not return. No more garden of Eden. So we have to work for our food. God said life will be difficult compared to life in paradise. But still, we have times in our life that we uh, almost feel like we are in, in uh, paradise, don't we? As we heard already in the, in the Sunday school, we, we are not uh, experiencing persecution as many people do in, in the different parts of the world. And it's a pleasure to work for many of us. <coughs> Isn't that that almost a, a garden of Eden? But then we must realize that we do not know what life actually was in the garden of Eden. If it were not for God's grace, life would be more difficult as God showed him already in, uh, in the, to Adam and Eve when he clothed them with, with skin that, that 
a sign already that that he he cares us he makes it easier for us and then we might think uh, <clears throat> would it not be possible to to just start a new generation training children in a way that they would not have contact with uh, with the world with with sins so they would be like Adam and Eve were in the in the garden without sin would that be possible well we have seen part of that when we see uh, people moving in the far into a jungle to try to move away from the world and be separated and that that can prevent them part part of the struggles in their life but it is still not a new generation without sin because it says in Romans 3:23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God you see that is not it's not possible to do that to start a new generation without sin <clears throat> So we need a solution. We have all sin. We have all experienced darkness. And then when we look at uh, Jeremiah, that, that gives us the hope. Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 33. That, that's been said long before Jesus was born. It says in Jeremiah 31, verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, say the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. So that's, uh, that sounds so good that, and will be their God and they shall be my people. And verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the lord for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the lord and then listen at this last part here for i will forgive their iniquity and i will remember their sins no more there is light hallelujah that is prophesied way before before jesus came into the world <clears throat> and then in numbers 24 verse 17 it says i shall see him but not now i shall behold him but not nigh there shall come a star out of jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Shaz. <coughs> For behold, uh, sorry, this is another chapter here, Isaiah, Isaiah 60. And another prophecy, Isaiah 60 verse one, arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen up on thee. So that gives hope, and that, that's, uh, that's the solution of the darkness we were put in. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise up on thee, and his glory shall be seen up on thee. So we see light, light is coming. <clears throat> and the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Doesn't that sound like a paradise? So let's uh, look a little bit into uh, the New Testament and uh, the story of John the Baptist. 
find that in, uh, in Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 5. <coughs> we have here a, a beautiful story of uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth. We know already what what the story is. <coughs> they had no child, and uh, as we know at that time that the uh, women uh, that had no child, they were looked down at. They were <coughs> not uh, not as pleasant as to, as the others were. So Elizabeth had always felt that pressure. <coughs> and now they were oh, age already and uh, no hope for ever having a child. And then the uh, <coughs> angel came and uh, when uh, Zacharias was uh, on duty in the temple, angel came and, and talked to Zacharias in verse 13, but the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call him his name John. So isn't that interesting? In, in that time, an aged couple, they would now they would their prayers was heard were heard their prayers were heard and uh, <laughs> they would have <clears throat> wanted to have that child long before. <clears throat> but uh, here we see that we shall not be impatient when we when we pray. <clears throat> God will God hears our prayers and <clears throat> he will answer according to his will. In verse 14, and thou shalt have joy and gladness and many shall rejoice at his birth. <coughs> so we, are, <coughs> we know that it's still not, not Jesus, it is John the Baptist to be born. <coughs> For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be, shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him <clears throat> in the spirit of power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <clears throat> then we know that uh, Zacharias he couldn't quite grasp what would happen. He uh, he couldn't understand <clears throat> how that should should happen and and uh, the uh, the age that they were. And uh, then it happened that uh, that he could not not speak. He was dumb until uh, <clears throat> the time came that that a son was born. And we read here in. Uh, Verse 58, and her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by that this name. <clears throat> and they made signs to his father how he would have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote, saying, His name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hell country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. <clears throat> and then uh, verse 67 
And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Notice here that he says for us, and that is valid until today, that is for us. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he <clears throat> swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the day of our life. And thou, a child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So that's still not, it's still not Jesus, but it's John the Baptist who was sent before Jesus to pre prepare the way. <clears throat> and that is bringing us the light the light after the darkness. In Ephesians 5, verse 8, it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, providing what is acceptable unto the Lord. And then uh, verse 14, <clears throat> Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So there's something for us to do. Then back again to Matthew 4, 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region of shadows of death, light is sprung up. And let's, let's take use of that light. Let that shine through, through us. That Many more people will will see that light. <clears throat> I ask you to stand for a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are gathered before you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the health that we have to be here. We thank you for your word, especially, and especially for the light after the darkness. I ask that you would uh, increase that light in us, that we would, would shine wherever we are. We, we are thinking of those that are sick today, that you be with them, bless them, and uh, also those that are traveling or away from, from home, protect them and uh, and uh, especially that you light, let your light shine through each one, that we uh, may use that for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Be seated. <clears throat>